stuff. I mean, the Bible tells us to greet one another with a holy kiss. In America, we shake hands and we hug, right? Um, and yet, what it's caused us to do is almost step away from that and be, I, I don't want to be as affectionate or friendly. But there's also other habits. Church life stuff. I mean, just think about this one. I mean, we get restricted to not have church in our building. we got to do it online. And suddenly, people begin to be really cozy with the fact that they can get up out of bed and crawl in their pajamas and just go watch church. Uh, one of our families calls it PJ Church, and they, they told their children, there's no reason for you to be late for PJ Church, Right? And uh, one dad told me early on, it was so hard to get our kids. We had to like physically say, we're standing for worship. Get up. Let's go. We're standing and singing. Because we get in these habits that suddenly gathering together in the house of God to hear the word of God preached with the people of God, where God uniquely ministers to his people, begins to be something that we just kind of go, oh, we don't need that as much. And so there's a move, and there's a move in a few in our uh, society to move church away from this to move it strictly online. And so they're counting their numbers online, and that's their, that's their church gathering. But not to mention the idea that isolation, what isolation has done to us, and the concept of getting together in small groups to study God's word together. We don't need that now because we've been in COVID. We've been doing it on our own, and we're quite well by ourselves. But then you've got the habits we're developing with our devices, Listen, I've talked to many people around our community who have said, in our church, who have just said, you know what, I, I find myself at the end of my Amazon watch list, and I'm just watching whatever. It's just indiscriminate screen watching. And at times, you find yourself almost being pulled away from your phone as you're in the middle of engaging with your family. And interpersonal relationships begin to go away. A, a guy uh, told me a while back, man, our church is struggling from, from screen fatigue. And I said, yeah, but many of the church are struggling with screen addiction. We cannot pull ourselves away from it. There's bad habits that we've developed, right? There's also some good habits. I mean, many people have stayed in their neighborhoods and they're walking around their neighborhoods like never before and people are engaging with their neighbors like they never have before. That's a good habit. There's also those moments, I remember them vividly in the early part of the COVID restrictions when we were on lockdown, we couldn't go anywhere. My kids and I were building stuff and putting things together and then we'd sit down together and have a family meal together and hang out and talk and my boys were looking me in the eye and we were having great conversations. I was talking to somebody recently and they said, you know, I have to be honest, is it bad to wish that we could go back to the restrictions so I can see my kids again? And it's like, it's a good habit, family table. Dialoguing over life and discipling our kids. And, and it was a good thing that that kind of locked us in to do something. I've, I've heard from many of you that you've said, you know, I'm reading my Bible more than ever before. Those are good habits. I think through this whole thing, we've seen good habits and bad habits. But there's another habit I want us to think about. And it's a fact that we, we really need to ponder this. We've got to consider it. We have to watch our hearts in it. And it has to do with the amount of information that we are taking in currently. We live in an age where we're literally living in an information age. I, I say we're drowning in information. And I don't know about you, have you noticed how easy it is for information to travel, for misinformation to travel, and even for disinformation to travel? How quickly and the speed that it gets out there. Have you noticed how fast People jump to conclusions without knowing all the facts. I, I've, I've literally told, it, told Jill as I've read a news article, like, these people weren't even in the Oval Office. How do they know? Or I've heard a rant online about something about a civil official, and I've said, I don't mean to be odd, but you weren't there. So how do you know? Not to mention the amount of injustices that are seen, and once all the facts are known, it really doesn't look like much of an injustice. Some of you might have noticed the story that happened this last week where the Pittsburgh Steelers had decided they were going to put the name of a, of, a, of, a, of a police brutality shooting on the back of their helmets. They all agreed to put the same name on the back of their helmet. One gentleman uh, who was an Army veteran, he's a right tackle, decided he was going to take tape and write the name of a, of a black officer who had been shot in the Iraqi war. So he did. 
The media jumped all over it and said, how wrong of this guy to put the name of somebody else on his helmet? Well, the team came out and said, hey, listen, he's free to do as he wants to do. Then the following week, this past week, their most, probably most experienced social justice advocate, their center, who is one of their captains, came out and said, I'm actually going to cover the name of the man on my helmet that's been put on there. And here's what he said, because we don't know all the facts. And then he said this, it's time that we as a society start gathering all the facts before we jump to conclusions. What a novel idea. And yet how much we do this on a regular basis. I heard recently of a story of somebody who had potentially had their name tarnished and their reputation taken down and potentially their job lost if it not for somebody else saying, that's not the case. That's not the facts. It's easy for us to do. We jump to conclusions. Things, it's funny and yet sad how terms like this, science and data... I mean, the moment I mention that, I can feel you like, oh, science and dead. I'm about to slap a scientist and a dadetician. <laughs> and depending on the paradigm that you come from, science and data is either omniscient or it's deeply troubling. Right, just this week we were going over, kind of figuring out how do we plan for church moving forward with the numbers we've seen at the field. And I asked Christina, can you just put together a graph, kind of help me navigate through what we're looking at averages? And she just literally said to me, I can make the data look any way you want it to look. How do you want me to do that? And I said, we're not saying that here, right? Okay. So the question I want to wrestle with this morning is this. How do we protect ourselves from being easily swayed by non-truths, half-truths, or narratives that don't fit with our worldview or our paradigm. Now, what you're going to notice is, I'm not saying, how do you keep from believing those things? That's one part of it. I'm asking, how do we as Christians respond to half-truths, non-truths, to narratives that only fit with our paradigm, that we have a tendency just to dive in and believe, and we respond in a way that is not helpful to the glory of God, to the work of God, and not helpful to our society. Those are the questions that I'm wrestling with. It's something I think we have to think about as people of God, because I think that God deeply cares about how we as his people respond in the age that we're living in. I think that God wants us to be measured. I think he wants us to be mature. I think he wants us to have self-control and not be taken captive by everything that comes down the pipe to us or what comes across our social media feeds or what happens on our iPad, uh, no, uh, Apple News, or what we read in the newspaper. That's why I want us to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. It feels like we're slowly kind of coming out of this COVID thing a little bit. Now listen, granted, I don't know if you've been reading much, but I start getting nervous when I start reading terms like twindemic. It's like twindemic, the flu and COVID type. Of, and I'm like, oh my goodness sake. Suddenly you can feel people beginning this panic. It feels like we're crawling out of it. For, for Finally we were able to get outside yesterday. On, on Friday we were outside. We can see the sun again. It feels like things are kind of moving toward some semblance of normalcy. But I would guess all of us have developed good habits, bad habits. And I would predict, here's a prediction, this is not hard to predict, that over the next couple months, you are going to have lots of information. Lots of information. So we need to be people who train ourselves for the time that we're living in. That's what I hope to do this morning. Here's the big idea of what I want to see this morning. Hoping in Jesus Christ will empower us to not be swayed by the lies of this world and will benefit us now and later. Hoping in Jesus Christ will empower us to not be swayed by the lies of this world and will benefit us now and later. That's what I hope to see. So let's stand together. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter, or excuse me, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 10. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 10. <clears throat> this is the reading of God's word. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, but rather... Train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance 
For this we toil and strive because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful today that because we have need, that you have made us. We're thankful that you have made us to be needy people so that we would look to you and respond to you in a way that we're desperate. And Father, we are desperate today. We live in a day when so much information is being thrown in our face and we need to be able to not be swayed in either believing or responding in a way that would be contrary to your glory. So help us this morning. Empower us to train our for godliness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Now, First and Second Timothy were books and letters written by the Apostle Paul to his beloved son in the faith, Timoth- faith, Timothy. Timothy was pastoring a church in Ephesus. It was one of Paul's favorite towns, and Timothy was one of Paul's favorite people. And so he wrote these two letters to speak to Timothy about what it means to be a pastor. But he wanted Timothy to do something really funny. He wanted him to take this personal letter, and he wanted Timothy then to read it to his congregation. You can imagine the Apostle Paul giving you a job description and then saying, now, take that job description and you read it to your people so they know exactly what I've told you to do as a pastor, and secondly, that they know what to expect. So when we read First and Second Timothy, we have to hear the Apostle Paul speaking to young Timothy and speaking to a church about how they're to live and conduct themselves. Now, if you pull out your outline, you'll see we've got three points we want to look at this morning. And the first point is we want to look at the silly myths. You'll see this in verse 7. It's very clear that Paul wanted pastors and churchgoers to have nothing to do with what he calls silly myths. So we've got to understand, what are these silly myths that Paul is concerned with? Well, the good thing for us is, in 1 Timothy, he's already covered a bunch of them. So if you look back with me at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, it'll come up on the screen if you need it. Notice a few things that Paul told Timothy. Timothy was to challenge people who taught a different doctrine other than the one true doctrine of Christ and Him crucified. He said these things are about, these people argue about endless genealogies. What they were basically doing is taking their family lines and they were arguing over their family heritage to prove their social status and their religious status and their spiritual status. Paul says this was empty and vain discussion. It was not moving the ball down the road at all. It was philosophical but not helpful. You ever had those kind of conversations? People talk in these high-minded terms but it's not helping you at all. And they spoke boldly about things they knew nothing about. But then in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul gets even more specific. And he said, these people are false teachers who have left the faith. Meaning, they have turned away from the gospel of Jesus Christ and the one true way to be reconciled to God through Jesus. And they're paying attention, he says, to deceitful spirits. They're insincere liars. Their consciences are seared. In other words of saying this is, they think good is evil, and evil is good. They forbid the God-ordained union of marriage, the one man, one woman for one lifetime covenant that God has made, and they adhere to strict dietary laws to basically say, do you see how spiritual you are because we abstain from certain foods? So Paul's concern for Timothy in this church was that their people and their pastor would not get so caught up in all the cultural lingo and the the tsunami of information that they would forget the one central message of all time. And he gives them that message in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners and that there is a king, the one true king, who is the king of the ages, He is immortal. He is invisible. He is the only God to whom should be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. And Paul's concern in chapter 4, verse 7 is to pay no attention. Don't have have nothing to do with silly myths. Now, what he means by that is don't notice they exist. He doesn't mean that. He means be aware of them, but don't be 
Don't let them sway you away from the one central message of Christ and Him crucified and there being a king in heaven who is overseeing all things. Don't let that sway you. Don't let it have any place in your heart that would pull you away from this glorious truth. There is a king, and his name is Jesus, and he has come for you, and he's come to restore all things for the glory of his great name. Don't be swayed. Have nothing to do with silly myths. Now you can see how this is not only applicable for first century Ephesus, who was battling with people, bombarding them with the gospel, but you can see how true it would be for 21st century America. I mean, just think about the silly myths that we've had going on in the last uh, six months. Abortion clinics must stay open, but churches must close. If you gather in a large group to worship Jesus, you're a danger to society, but if you protest in a large group, you're benefiting society. Gender is not something you're born with. It's rather something you identify with. So you can be whatever you want to be with regards to gender. doesn't matter how God made you. The list could go on and on and on, but you get the point. And if you disagree with the current silly myths of the culture, here's what happens. You're called name like patriarchal, misogynist, or racist. You're outcasted. You're canceled. You're deemed as dangerous. And in a very real and scary sense, here's what we're seeing right before our eyes as if we've never seen it before in our time. We're seeing Romans 1 played out. And here's what the writer of Romans said. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. And where this gets really concerning for the 21st century Christian living in our culture is on a few fronts. The first, for, the first part of confusion and concern is when Christians start believing these silly myths of the culture. Gender doesn't matter. The right to life doesn't matter. Personal property doesn't matter. Every person made in the image of God doesn't matter. The list could go on and on and on. And we'd say, why does personal property matter? Well, if God said, thou shalt not steal, what God is essentially saying, thou shalt own. Why does the right to life matter? Well, if God's the one that created life, and God said, if you take a life, you deserve to die because of that life, that tells you how valuable life is to God. So one concern is Christians beginning to believe the silly myths of the culture. But another concern is that Christians run in fear of the backlash from the culture and won't, won't, don't speak up, or as Paul said to Timothy, don't challenge those who believe such things. This happens on our college campuses. We send our kids off to college. Hopefully they'll get an education, and they are getting an education because if they stand up for what is right, They get called names. They get canceled. They get pushed out. They get F's on their papers. Their culture societal group around them calls them all sorts of names. It happens at every level of society. And so instead of saying anything, we back out of speaking, and we back out of saying anything because of fear. But there's another area of concern, and I think this hits more of us at home than anything else. It's the area of concern that we as Christians then begin to fight with and go to war with the exact same tools that the world is using. Vitriol, anger, cancel culture, disrespect, not treating people with gentleness and honor because they're made in the image of God. Therefore, that's the concerns. We, we have these issues in our hearts. We, we're being swayed one way or the other. One is we're believing them. One is we're backing out in fear. And another one is we're responding in unrighteous anger. 
And if God is concerned about the way we respond, what has God told us about how to respond? Well, the beauty is that's our second point. You can see it right in the text. The beauty is God does not hide this from us. God says it very clearly. He says to Timothy, train yourself. Notice verse 7, how he puts something. He says, pay no attention. Don't, don't be swayed by these silly myths. Rather. In other words, if you ever want to know, like, put off. Put off paying attention to silly myths and letting them sway you. And put on training yourself. Rather than believing these silly myths, being in fear of them, being unrighteously impatient with them, Paul says, train yourself. This word train comes the, from the word that we take gymnastics from. When I was a young kid growing up, my dad really thought it would be a great idea since I was an athlete to get me in gymnastics because he felt like gymnastics was going to teach me how to be flexible and you know, how to have you know, power movements and the whole thing. And after the first three days of gymnastics, I had pain in places I never dreamed of having. Right, And, and I finally said to my dad, I said, Dad, listen, I appreciate this, but I, I can't do it. This is hard. Gymna- the word gymnastics implies hard work. And the word myths imply mental ideas. It implies worldviews. It implies paradigms, which tells me something very important. To train myself to deal with silly myths I have to do hard level thinking training. This isn't something I can get off a bumper sticker of a car that gives me some cool cliche to say. This is hard mental work to know how am I going to train myself to not be swayed to respond in a way that doesn't honor Christ. Notice what he tells us to train ourselves for. He says, hard thinking training is for godliness. Another way to put that is, it trains us to respond like Jesus responded in his culture. Or, to put it in uh, a biblical verse, you know, address, it trains us to respond as the fruit of the Spirit is displayed. With love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Just looking at that list, do you see anywhere in that list where there is vitriol, where there is unrighteous indignation and anger, where there is uh, retribution to take back something? No, you don't. You find a measured, mature, self-controlled response. So what Paul does here in 1 Timothy is fascinating. He acknowledges there's silly myths out there. They're real. They're out there. There's paradigms and crazy ideas. But he also acknowledges our need to be trained in godliness mentally and spiritually so that we can respond when these silly myths show up. Right? Now, listen. Crazy talk has always been part of a Genesis 3 world. I mean, go back and look at Genesis chapter 4. Cain rises up. He's mad because God did not accept his offering. And God says, why are you mad? All you got to do is obey. What does Cain do? Crazy talk goes off in his head. I'm going to murder my brother. It's always been a part of our world. It's not just now. If the Roman Empire were on Twitter, if Nero had Facebook, what would that look like? The difference now is the rapid pace at which we can get our hands on crazy talk. The volume seems to be louder because it's coming so fast at us. So we've got to, it is a necessity that we as Christians train ourselves so that we're not swayed by the crazy talk and we respond to crazy talk when it happens in a way that honors Christ, benefits others, and serves our community and our culture. 
That, that's what Paul is speaking to us about. Now, last week, as an example, I was, I was listening to a podcast last week, and the, the, the author of the podcast gave a, a fantastic analogy to how Christians need to be prepared. He said, in speaking of the upcoming election, he called it the wounded duck football punt election. Now, here's what he means by that. Here's what he means. When you punt a football, and it's a wounded duck football, it's flopping all over the place. And when that football hits the ground, you have no idea where it's going to go. And you have literally, now I, I was the punt, I was the dude receiving the punts. And when you got a wounded duck football punt, you like, you had your head on a swivel, and you're away. When that ball hit the ground, you got to be ready to move any different direction. And his point was, this election can go any way possible. And a Christian had better have their head on the proverbial spiritual swivel. How's this going to go? To respond appropriately either way. Now what's shocking about that is we as Christians actually think God's going to give us in this society a nice perfect spiral punt that we just pack underneath and we catch that sucker and when we go down the road, it's like the parting of the Red Sea right to the goal line. And something happens when you receive a punt. This happened to me against our arch rivals. I got a football on a kickoff. I am moving down the sidelines. There is nobody but me in the end zone until a guy named Cornelius Cannon, that was his name, hit me right in the ear hole and put me 10 yards on the track. We as Christians get hit like that and we go, wait, that's not what's supposed to happen? Living in a Genesis 3 world, Every time it happens, it's a wounded duck football punt. We've got to have our head on a swivel all the time, prepared for everything that may come down to us. And the same holds true, not with just an election, but with every silly myth that you're going to hear over and over and over again. I hope you see your need to train yourself. What happens if it goes the way we want it to go? What happens the way if it doesn't go the way we want it to go? What happens when laws end up on the docket that you go, this is insanity? How do you respond to it? How do you speak to it? How do you address it in a way that helps others in your sphere of influence understand the beautiful, glorious reality of what God has for His people? See? So the question is, how do we train ourselves for godliness? How do we mentally get ourselves prepared to be trained for godliness? Well, the good thing is, Paul tells us how. Look at the verse just above verse 7, verse 6. He says, being trained in the words of faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. You see what Paul used? He used the exact same word trained that he uses in verse 7. To show us we're trained by God for godliness by being trained in the words of faith and the doctrinal principles found in God's word. This is why, listen, friends, when you got Christian friends saying to you, we don't need the Bible anymore, we just need the Holy Spirit, they, they're on the verge of, of believing and agreeing with every silly myth. The Word of God is what trains us. The Word of Christ trains us. The doctrine of the invisible, immortal God trains us to see life the way God sees it. See, example. In God's Word, we're trained to see how God values every life. From conception, from the womb to the tomb, He values every one of them. So I told a brother this morning, you take a baby from the womb and you kill it, what's going to keep you from taking a 60-year-old man and killing him? You start there, you're going to keep moving. We're trained to see that God values property rights. What people own is theirs. We're trained to see that all people are made in the image of God, not just one select group. So we're trained in. All lives matter. I'll say it. All of them matter. That does not make me a racist. Every life matters. It's a given in Scripture. Every one of them matter. 
We're trained to see that God created us in His image with our God-given gender to reveal something about the glory of this great God. We're trained to love our neighbor, protect the innocent, and stand for justice. Listen, you can be an abortion rights activist and say, I can't stand the taking of an innocent life. Then you better be just as bothered if a police officer does unjustly shoot a black man. Life is life. In God's word, we're trained to see world through the lens of God. In a Genesis 3 world, we see where it's fallen in sin everywhere, and we're not shocked by it as if, oh my word, I just got tackled. No, what you do is you line back up and you go on offense. That's what you do. Knowing you're going to be facing a defense, which we're going to talk about next week, we are in a spiritual war. We cannot forget that. And that spiritual war does not have certain names on it. We see the benefits of being trained in godliness and walking and obeying God. And we see the curse of rebelling against God. Friends, if you want to look at the curse of rebelling against God, just notice your cities are on fire. We're trained to see God's providential good rule over all things so that even in chaos, here's what happens. Our consciences are informed, not seared. The concern I have for many Christians right now is they're becoming cynical. Their consciences are cynical, not not, not informed. They're not seared, but they're slowly getting there with the way they treat others because of their disagreements. And here's what happens. If if we're trained by God's word, then we, we are positioned for that wounded duck football punt. When a pandemic hits and that wounded football hits the ground or racial riots blow up and that wounded football hits the ground, a Christian trained in godliness by the word of God is measured, mature, and self-controlled in what they do. You know why? God's word gives an answer. God's word provides hope. God's word reveals the reality of Christ, the king over all things, who has given us a life to live on this earth. And he's not, he's not shocked by anything going on. And this training helps us see all the ideas that are raised up against the knowledge of God and his son, and we can refute them. We can challenge those who believe them in our spheres with gentleness and respect. And this training guards us from being unrighteously angry, from fretting and stewing and unrighteous uh, anxiety and fear. This training helps us wage the warfare which we are in with the weapons of God. And you know what they are? They're not name calling. They're the gospel of God, the power of God. They're prayer. They're the word of God. And they're us serving others for the glory of God and then doing this, believing God will go do God's given work. And leaving the results in the hands of God. So Christian, listen, rather than giving in to silly myths, train yourself. Do the hard work of training yourself. For godliness. And where this gets really hard is that we will take on half truths, non truths, and narratives that only fit with our worldview rather than asking, is this true and where does it fit with God's word? And asking, how do we then engage in our sphere of influence to speak the truths of God to bring life and hope into a situation where there's massive darkness? How do we do it? You guys know your dear friend Luis, who's up in Burien, Washington right now. Here's Luis, this wonderful Hispanic man married to a Caucasian woman, got up in his pulpit and basically said, listen, I realize the Black Lives Movement is this. We all need to know, and it's very true. Go to their website and check it out. You can see it all over the place. It's anti-patriarchal. It's anti the nuclear family. It's anti the very things that Christian people would agree to, and their, their leaders have been trained in Marxism. And Luis said this, there's a difference between the Black Lives Move organization and believing that black lives matter. They do. It's a given. But I want to raise the bar. All lives matter. 
And here's this Hispanic man married to a Caucasian woman who was accused of being a racist. So what does he do? Rather than getting angry, rather than dealing with it with vitriol, Luis asks individuals, could we just sit and talk over what God says about this? And calmly, graciously, respectfully brought the light to bear. Now you see my point. That's being trained in godliness. That's doing the hard work, the mental work. And not just fitting into our own narrative because we like it. So then the question is, why do we do this and what empowers us to do it? Well, we see this in the text. The purpose for this training is for two reasons. Training for godliness helps us now and it helps us later. Now it helps us because we don't fall prey to believing these myths, even though the whole world is screaming them at us. We don't fear these myths because we believe the God, that God's word is so powerful and true, it will win in the marketplace of ideas. Elijah was not at all afraid. Bring out your, bring out your bell, worshipers. Bring them out. Let's talk. Whichever God's going to answer with fire, he's the one true God. Our God is not afraid for us to throw his truth out in the middle of all this chaos. And it also keeps us from fighting like the rest of the world fights with their weapons. Friends, we have answers. We're not reactionary. We're responsive and responsible. We're not anxious. We're mindful and circumspect. We're winsome, not worried. Godliness benefits us now. You can serve others around you right now with the training that you're getting from God's word to be godly and to respond to those situations. But it also benefits us later. Listen, the only way to know and to ensure that you will have eternal life is by trusting in the the story of God's own son, Jesus, found in the Bible. That's the only way. God's plan for eternal life in Christ. When we're trained for godliness and God's word, we're ready to meet our king and we will stand before him unashamed. But if you're not trained in godliness and you don't know Jesus Christ, there will be a day when you stand before an almighty God and you'll give an account for your life. And you have to ask, wouldn't you much rather be ready now and not ready later? Silly myths come and go, right? And they, they may benefit us in the short term. You might gain favor with some new friends that you didn't have before. The court of public opinion might applaud you for just a short moment. And listen, as one who's had the court of public opinion applaud you, let me tell you how quickly that court can change. We might find and enjoy a high and an ecstasy just for a moment, for a little while with that hit on that drug or that immoral relationship. But let me tell you something. We all know the regret comes in the morning. We all know buying into anything other than what God has said in his word will certainly not benefit us later. It won't. It'll buy you eternal death. It will not give you eternal life. Godliness benefits us now and later. And the only way you can be godly The only way you can be, can train yourself to not be held captive by these silly myths is something Paul displays very well in verse 10. Notice what he says. For this, to this end, we toil and strive. To what end? It's the end of being able to meet our God. It's it's that the godliness is, is benefiting us now. It's training for godliness now. That's the toil. That's the striving. But notice what he says. For to this end, we toil and we strive Because, because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Because we have our hope set on the living God, we toil and strive. Because we have our hope set on the living God, we train ourselves for godliness. Because we have our hope set on the living God, we have nothing to do with silly myths. The power for Paul to do to tell us, what, how can you do this, comes through the power of the gospel. If we do not have our hope set on the living God, who is our Savior, listen, you will fall prey. 
You will. And this is where it should really challenge us. So over the last several months, what disciplines in your life reveal that your hope is set on the living God? Then keep them. Keep working at them. Over the last several months, what disciplines in your life have caused you to be swayed by silliness? And by this, I mean either they cause you fear, unrighteous anger, impatience, suspicion. They've, they've caused you to doubt something that God says is true. Or you've been swayed to fight in the same way that everybody else is fighting. I think God's word would be clear. Have nothing to do with that. Get away from it altogether. Some, some people, listen, I know of some of you. Some of you have deleted your Apple news feed because you said, man, it's, just, I, it's too tempting to just be swayed. Some of you have deleted your Facebook accounts off your phone. Some of you have said, look, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I made a commitment. If I'm going to watch something, I'm reading my Bible the, the same amount. I've got, I've got to do something to break this vicious cycle. Train yourself for godliness. And the only way to do it is through the power of Christ. And here's the beauty. You might say, I can't do that, man. I'm too weak. That's the power and the beauty of Christ. So here's just a little training help from a coach. Fundamentals matter. More time in God's word, less time on social media and in the news. More time praying, less time in anxiety and fear and worry. I started making a commitment a few years ago that whenever I got anxious, I would then just say, Lord, help me to pray about the very thing I'm anxious about right now. And just begin to pray about that issue. More time being kind and treating people with respect and treating them as image bearers and less time being mad that you're wearing a mask. How about you guys? I, I'm going to a store sometimes and I'm kind of ticked. Like, I got where's, I mean, come on, man. And I find myself looking at the ground, steaming over it rather than responding appropriately before the Lord. More time in biblical community, biblical Bible study with others, mentoring and being mentored with others than isolation. I want to speak to retirees for a moment. Finding retirees right now saying, we just can't wait to travel, now get out of this thing. You're not going to get out of it because it's in you. It's in you. Be in biblical community. Serve others to help them see what you see. Help them grow in grace so they can affect their generations for the gospel. How about more time serving other people, less time being suspicious of our civil authorities? Think how often we do that one. It's like I was saying earlier, there's only one in this world, in this universe, who is in the Oval Office and in the governor's house at the same time. And there'll be a day, there'll be a day, friend, when God will expose it all. And we will see what was right and what wasn't right. And you may go, how can we don't know now? Because God has decided not to reveal it now. Instead, God's kept something secret for us, and those things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed, the Bible says, belong to, to us and our children. For what reason? So we can respond to it in a way that God would be glorified, that his gospel would go forth, and we could be a benefit to our society. You can see why you need to be trained for godliness. Let's pray. Father, I think all of us can see in our hearts the, <clears throat> the angst, the anger, the unrighteous responses. Maybe even times we've been mean to people. Uh, somebody told us to pull up our mask and we just got mad. Maybe it's a moment, Lord, when we were told that people didn't hug and we were like, I'm going to hug you anyway, just get out of the way. And we've, we've not treated others in a way that would honor you. Maybe we've believed some of these silly myths, Lord, and, and, and <clears throat> for the Christian that's in that category today, I just pray that you would open their eyes to the truth of your word. Lord, it's, it's not the truth of Dave York or, 
or covenant life fellowship, but the tr- it's a truth of God's word that life matters, marriage matters. So many things matter to you and you've spoken about them. And I pray for the fearful Christian today. I pray that they would see that, Lord, you are powerful enough in them to help them to speak with courage, to be trained for godliness, to influence those in their sphere for your glory and the good of your gospel and the good of this society. And then, Father, we do pray for our land. We pray that people would begin to see the truth of the living God. That the gospel of Jesus Christ would go out in such a powerful way that you would bring such revival that we would say, look what God has done. Thank you, God, that you see and know all things. And thank you that we don't. Help us to respond to what we see and to what we don't in a way that honors you, glorifies you, and blesses people around us for your great name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.